Welcome back to the Pastor's Study. I'm Pastor Seth. This is my wife, Jennifer. Hello. And today we're discussing how to read the letters. <laughs> or the epistles, if you want to be fancy. <laughs> most, of the re most of the epistles were written by Paul, but we also have some written by James and John and Peter. Mm -hmm. Some of the letters, or most letters, are written to churches. Well, some are written to specific individuals, and some are very generic and just kind of tossed out there, like like a pamphlet <laughs> that you might find at a you know at in the back of the church or to whom it may concern to, among the believers, like an editorial to the <laughs> newspaper. There we go. Well, the point is, is that there are, we have many different letters, and they kind of have different themes, um, they're covering different topics, different people, different places. And so it might seem that there's a wide variety that they're going to have to be really specific, like, okay, we have to read this letter this way and that letter that way. And thankfully, that's not a huge concern because in the ancient world, most letters followed the same pattern. Okay. Whether you were writing a letter to your brother in the next city over, or you're writing a long epistle to the people in Rome, there's going to be certain patterns that each and every letter is going to follow. For example, uh, Paul is a classic letter writer, and if you read one of his letters, you're going to find that there's always a declaration of who the sender is, mm -hmm. there is a blessing and a thanksgiving for the people who he's writing the letter to, mm -hmm. and then you get the body, and then there's a final benediction or blessing at the very end. Now, you don't have to really know that per se in order to understand the letter, but the point is, is that all these different letters, even though they're to different people and are at different times, they're all going to follow a nice same structure, and that's helpful for us to get us in the right mindset when we're reading the epistle. So how is this helpful for us? Well, especially for Paul, most letter writers are going to front load everything that they're going to say in their letter into that first section, the, the, the greeting and the blessing and the thanksgiving portion. Paul is, does this quite often where the words he uses in the blessing are going to be the themes that he writes about later on. So he might call himself an apostle of Jesus Christ, or he might call himself a, uh, a slave of Jesus Christ, or the doulos is the word there, which can be translated as slave or servant, or he might say fellow workers in Christ. So depending on what he's, the tone of the letter, mm -hmm. the themes he's going to be talking about, are all going to be kind of front-loaded into that first section. So reading that first chapter is going to be very important for having an understanding of what the letter is going to be about. And so this is kind of leads into the second biggest point about letters is that they're not systematic theology. <laughs> These are written, letters written f between people who know each other. And with that, I'll segue to my wife. So the letters are one of those places where it's very important to have some grasp of the context. Mm. Uh, most of the letters that we find in the New Testament can be tied to the activities of the Apostles in the Book of Acts. John's letters not so much because he hadn't moved out into the mission field yet when Acts ended, but Peter and Paul and James, their roles in the church are all established in the Book of Acts, and so we can understand where the letters are coming from and a little bit of where they're going too. But Paul, in particular, writes his letters to specific churches that are going through specific situations. Sometimes he thanks God for their endurance. Sometimes he has to correct their behavior. Sometimes he has to protect their orthodoxy. He always has a very specific situation in mind as he is writing the letter. Mm -hmm. And so, 
we have to view the letter through the lens of that situation. Now that doesn't mean that the letter won't speak to us today. Uh, in Philippians, when Paul goes off on a joyous proclamation of a hymn of praise to Christ and how Christ has come down and that brings us back up so we can shine like stars in a corrupt generation, that's still very true of the church today and it applies very much to Christ. He hasn't changed. <laughs> But the situation in Philippi is different from our situation, and so we need to appreciate that while his words are very applicable to our lives, we should press on to the goal, and we should believe that we can do anything Christ calls us to do in his kingdom, because he will give us strength. What Paul was talking about was something very specific that the Philippians were going through. And so, when you consider the context, those words will take on new or a new, deeper meaning. Mm -hmm. When you consider that Paul was going through persecution and t warning them that there would be persecution and telling them that Christ had brought him through the persecution and with his soul and his capacity to forgive and submit intact, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me takes on a whole new level <laughs> of meaning. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for Corinthians. I, everyone loves to ch quote the 1 Corinthians 13, the chapter on love. But when you consider that he was rebuking them for acting in very unloving ways toward each other, yep. for championing one ability or one gift over someone else's gift and contribution to the congregation, for abusing the Lord's Supper and disregarding the unity of the saints in favor of licentiousness and gluttony and, <laughs> and prejudice. And take, suing each other in courts and claiming to follow Paul while I follow Apollo, so I follow Cephas, and yeah. A chapter on love, which starts out by disregarding all appearances of gifts, be it speaking in tongues or speaking with wisdom or the gift of prophecy or knowledge, all those impressive gifts without love are nothing but obnoxious. Yeah, That's its erect rebuke. It's not just a pretty poem. It's a slap in the face. And I would say that's very applicable for us today, <laughs> looking at the church, especially here in America, just how divided we are. We might not follow individual people, but we certainly oh, um, cling to our denominations. And, yes. And yeah, there are some like... I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Calvinist. <laughs> I'm a Mennonite. Those are all names. <laughs> That's true. That's a fair point. <laughs> but, yes, 1 Corinthians 13 is not a wedding poem. 1 Corinthians 13 is a rebuke <laughs> and further instruction on the way we should be behaving mm. toward each other. So when you consider the context that Paul, or Peter, or James, or John is writing into, the words become a lot more poignant and a lot more significant. Mm -hmm. Now that doesn't mean you have to go do a lot of research, though I love research. Please, go research <laughs> the situation of the early church. It will encourage you. One of the easiest ways to appreciate the context and the situation is to read the whole letter. So with all due respect to my husband, who says, make sure you read the first chapter, I'm going to say, read the letter. <laughs> Especially the shorter ones. Read them like a letter. Don't just pull out Galatians 5.23. Read the whole letter of Galatians. Well, if you're going to read the whole letter, you're definitely going to read chapter 1, then. <laughs> yes, you will. But don't stop after chapter 1. Read the letter like it's a letter. <laughs> like a Christmas letter that you get from your aunt. <laughs> Or from your mother or your spouse, somebody who's close to you and loves you. Mm -hmm. Because the whole letter will have the whole argument and the whole situation. Mm -hmm. Now there's one possible caveat with that, and that is that 2 Corinthians might be two letters. Well, <laughs> <laughs> so before we address that, yeah. so context of and the where they're at in their city mm -hmm. has been a big part of grasping God's word. Um, so yeah, it's always a good idea to get a either 
a, uh, sorry, my brain just turned off. It's I'm always good to do a little research to get a book on the history of the first century. But you don't have to get a whole library full of books, a different book for each letter. Read Acts. Acts will give you a lot of good background information, a good starting point for reading one of the epistles. For example, if you're going to read Galatians, go into Acts and read about Paul traveling through Galatia. And Phrygia. And Phrygia and Pamphylia. And so Paul in Corinth. Go read, I think that's Acts 15. I could be wrong. No. I'm not really good at <laughs> remembering that. It's probably later than that. Anyway. It was later than that. Anyway, <laughs> go, go read those chapters in Acts and then go read the epistle. And that will help help give you a good understanding of what's going on at the time because well Luke was there <laughs> nobody understands the history of the first century better than Luke so start <laughs> with Luke get his opinion on what was <laughs> happening before you go and try to get some modern-day scholars guesses at what happened 2,000 years ago there is some guesswork but yeah the go the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Acts have been proven very historically trustworthy. There are lots of external sources that back up what Luke says. Mm -hmm. He is a great place to start. And if you don't feel like reading, barring the Book of Acts, you should read the Book of Acts. <laughs> and there are lots of other resources out there. Um, YouTube is a thing, obviously, that's where you're seeing us. Uh, there are lots of authorities who publish their stuff in their stuff, their material, in video form as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I particularly, that's a big word that's very difficult time. to say. Particularly, <laughs> just roll with it, you know what I'm trying to say. Specifically, I like the Bible Project. Oh, yes. They do about three to five minute videos doing a summary of each book in the Bible. So, um, go look up the Bible Project and watch one of their videos to give a pretty good, quick overview of what you're about to read. Now, with that being said, since the, these are letters, sometimes it's best just to read them first so that you can come at them with a, a blank slate, if you will, with a clean mind, and then go get other people's opinions on it. So read it first, get your first, first get to your own first impressions, make your own opinions, and then mm. get other insights from others. And it's not like you have to be just one and done. Read these over and over and over again. They're short. You can do that. <laughs> um, consider these love letters from Jesus. I mean, who, I, back when we were dating, I read your letters over and over and over again. Yeah, likewise. And that's the kind of the attitude we should have going toward these letters. So I'll repeat again, this is not systematic theology. This isn't a big, thick book with logical arguments and making statements about philosophy and metaphysics and whatnot. These are love letters. Even when Paul is angry, he is still coming from a place of love. When Peter is writing his letters, telling believers to be faithful in the face of persecution, he's doing so from the position of love. Ultimately, the love that comes from Jesus Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit, according to the will of God the Father. So, and uh, so as a final note, all of these letters, their main goal is that we hold to the unity of faith, that we remain united to Christ and his body, which is the church. So even though we are divided in many ways, some follow Paul while others follow Paulos, and yet, it is Jesus who suffered on the cross on our behalf. It was Jesus whom we remember and celebrate when we go to the Lord's Supper. It is, and it is Jesus, the name of Jesus, along with the Father and the Son that we were baptized into. And as long as you remember that, you're going to do pretty well when you read these letters for your own. <laughs> Final words? No. no. All right. Then let's go together in prayer. Holy Father, Holy Son, and Holy Ghost, Lord, I thank you for brothers and sisters that you send to us to be a cloud of witnesses that strengthen us and encourage us 
to walk the path of Jesus. I thank you that your spirit unites us as one body, the body of Christ, so that whatever we do, we can always praise you and that we can rest in the presence of your kingdom. Lord, I pray that we'll go to your word, that we'll be strengthened in heart, in mind, in soul, and in deed, so that everything we do may be united to the body of Christ. So, Lord, I pray that you'll be with our brothers and sisters, wherever they are in the world. Give them strength to do their work. Heal their illnesses, diseases, and injuries, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will bless the relationships that they are in. And if any of their relationships are broken, Lord, I pray that your healing spirit will be there as well. May we, may we continue to forgive as you have forgiven us so that your name will be praised by every tongue and every person in this world. I thank you, God, that the harvest continues to come in, and I pray that you will continue to give your blessing until it is complete. And I pray that you'll be with the farmers as they prepare for winter. Be with our teachers and students at school. Be with our doctors and nurses in hospitals. And be with all the other professions whether in hospitals, or on the road, or in factories, or in our courthouses. Be with our police officers and firefighters. Be with our politicians, and men and women in the military. Be with all of your people everywhere in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Until next time, brothers and sisters, the grace and peace of Christ be with you all. Amen.